In this video, we're going to introduce Hermitian operators. Now, a Hermitian property of operators is a foundational property of quantum mechanical operators that actually leads to uh, really important properties of the eigenvalues, the energies, and the wave functions themselves. So it sets the bedrock foundation for other properties that we'll need to know and understand for uh, quantum mechanical wave functions, energies, and operators. So uh, in order to define Hermitian operators, uh, we consider our general eigenvalue equation where we have an operator omega and a wave function psi sub j. So I'm adding in this clarification of the subscript um, just of a state j. This is just being really general, uh, but we're going to need that distinction because we're going to have wave functions of other states in order to prove this Hermitian property. And obviously on the right-hand side, our uh, eigenvalue, the small omega, and psi j back again, right? So um, a very important integral to evaluate in quantum mechanics is to uh, evaluate another wave function acting on this operator, right? Or being involved in this integral overall space. So an integral of this type, where you have the complex conjugate of psi sub i, right? Which is a different state, right? There's a different wave function. Um, the complex conjugate of psi sub i times the wave times the operator, times acting on the wave function psi sub j and integrating over all space. If the operator omega is Hermitian, then this integral will be equal to the, uh, the reverse. If we reverse the wave functions and take the complex conjugate, right? So on the right hand side here, basically all we've done is reverse the two wave functions. So now instead of acting on psi sub j, the operator is acting on psi sub i, and we take the complex conjugate of the whole thing. And you can reduce this down to this integral on the far right hand side here, right? If you take the complex conjugate twice, you get the original function back. So that's why psi sub j is no longer, um, no longer has a complex conjugate. Our operator can obviously include imaginary components as we've seen with the momentum operator. So, um, so this, you have to take the complex conjugate of that guy. Um, and the complex conjugate of psi sub i, right? So basically, if this is true, if these integrals give you the exact same result, then this operator omega is Hermitian. Now, this is gonna be crucial for quantum mechanics. All quantum mechanical observables correspond to Hermitian operators, right? So let me write that down. So all quantum mechanical observables correspond to Hermitian operators, right? So if it is something that can be observed through quantum mechanical uh, means, right? So kinetic energy, momentum, um, total energy, all of these quantum mechanical observables will correspond to Hermitian operators. So let's look at this in the case of our momentum operator, right? So if I'm saying that all QM operators or observables should correspond to Hermitian operators, um, I want to try to prove it with one of the her operators that we're familiar with, right? So let's look at the momentum operator where we know that rho of x is equal to h bar over i d dx. Right, so this is our momentum operator. Let's show that it is Hermitian. So first we wanna know what, what do we have to show if we wanna show that it is Hermitian, right? So let's establish what we're trying to prove. So we're trying to prove that the following integrals are equal. So if we integrate over all space, negative infinity to positive infinity of psi sub i, rho x, psi sub j, dx should be equal to, oh, and let me put the complex conjugate here, should be equal to the following, right? Well, we have psi sub j, the complex conjugate of the momentum operator, and the complex conjugate of psi sub i, right? So if we're saying that this uh, operator, if we wanna show that it is Hermitian, then we have to show that these two integrals are actually equal. So let's evaluate each side. So first I wanna evaluate the left-hand side. So we're gonna evaluate the left-hand side and I'll use LHS 
to denote the left hand side. So the left hand side is this guy. So let's um, evaluate this. So we've got size of I star momentum operator acting on size sub J. So the first thing we want to do is have the momentum operator act on size sub J. We know that the first piece of this momentum operator Planck's constant over I, that's just a number. That's a constant. So that can come flying out of this integral. So we'll put it out front and we're going to integrate everything else over all available space. So we're going to have size sub I star and basically the derivative of the wave function psi sub j. So we're gonna take the derivative of psi sub j with respect to dx, overall space dx. Okay, so um, I put integration by parts, the general form of integration by parts up here um, because we're going to use it right now in order to expand this integral. So, um, so let's do that. So basically what we're gonna do is expand this integral We'll have H bar over I um, out front. And, uh, and so for, uh, this, for this case, right, we're gonna have this function as F and this function as G, right? So kind of um, you know, alluding to our, our general statement of integration by parts here, psi I is gonna be our F and psi J is gonna be G. So this first uh, piece of integration by parts is just F times G. So in our case, that's just going to be psi i complex conjugate times psi sub j. And we're going to have to integrate that from negative infinity to positive infinity. And that's going to be minus, again, h bar over i out front, integral from negative infinity to positive infinity of psi sub j, right? Because g is going to be the first part of this integrand right, times the differential of psi sub i star over dx. Right, so now let's look at this first term here, right? So this first term, when you evaluate any wave function at infinity, right? So this kind of goes back to our Born rules, right? At infinity, the wave function is gonna be zero anywhere um, where it is infinite, right? So if, it's, um, if we're looking at an infinite uh, X or infinite potential, then this wave function is going to be zero at that point. So this, this first term actually cancels out here, right? So we're left with the left hand side just being equal to this term. Okay, cool. So now let's look at the right hand side. So now we want to evaluate the right hand side and analogous to the previous point, I'll use RHS to denote right hand side. And so the right hand side is this guy, right? So we want to evaluate from negative infinity to positive infinity of psi sub j, the complex conjugate of the momentum operator acting on the complex conjugate of psi sub i dx, right? So um, if we look at this, so if we take the complex conjugate of the momentum operator, right? Basically what we're doing, we have this imaginary number in the denominator, right? So if we take the, um, the complex conjugate of this guy, complex conjugate of size of, of, um, of momentum operator would just be negative h bar over i d dx, right? So we wanna use this operator here since we have to use the complex conjugate of the momentum operator. So let's do that. So in this case, we're going to have, we're going to be able to pull out this first piece since it's just constant. So we'll have negative H bar over I, and we'll have an integral from negative infinity to positive infinity um, of this momentum operator acting on it. So we have size of, uh, size of J and the derivative of the complex conjugate size of i. And will you look at that? We have the exact same thing on the right-hand side that we have on the left-hand side, right? I forgot to put the uh, <laughs> dx on the outside here. 
that's that. Okay, so we have the exact same thing on the left hand side as we have on the right hand side. So that proves that the momentum operator is a Hermitian operator. So it corresponds to a quantum mechanical observable. It corresponds to a Hermitian operator. Okay, so there are two important um, things that arise because operators are Hermitian. And we're going to go through both of them in the next two videos, but I want to kind of tease them here. So the first really important consequence of operators being Hermitian is that all the eigenvalues correspond to real numbers. So all eigenvalues, I should just say are real numbers, right? All the eigenvalues from Hermitian operators are real numbers. And why is that important? These eigenvalues are supposed to correspond to quantum mechanical observables. They must be quantifiable numbers. They shouldn't be complex numbers. If something's going to be a momentum, it should be a quantity. It should be a number. So, um, so it should be a, a real number. So this is very consequential for quantum mechanical observables because it says that these operators give us real numbers that we can make sense of, right? The second consequence is that all wave functions are orthogonal. So all wave functions are orthogonal, right? So any um, wave functions that would be an eigenfunction of a Hermitian operator are going to be mutually orthogonal. And that may not mean anything to you right now. If you've studied vector calculus a lot, then you kind of know that there's a, you know, um, orthogonal property for vectors It's very similar to that. Um, so we'll look at that in more detail. But what this allows us to do is that each of these eigenvalues, since the wave functions are orthogonal, they actually correspond to distinct states. These different um, distinguishable energy states come from the fact that all of the wave functions are orthogonal. Again, we'll go through these details of each of these points in the next two lecture videos, but I just wanted to tease them here. They are a direct result of the fact that, um, that all quantum mechanical observables are Hermitian operators.